Hello and welcome to this session in which we will discuss the stock attribution rules section 318 of the IRS code. Prior knowledge is essential for the session such as the knowledge of stock redemption. And what is a stock redemption? Let's do it real quick. Stock redemption is when you sell your shares back to the company or when the company buys back the shares from the shareholder. In the prior session we looked at stock redemption in details and for a stock redemption to be considered a sale it must result in a substantial decrease substantial decrease in the shareholders interest in the company now why do we have to determine whether it's a sale or an exchange because it makes a difference uh, whether it's a sale slash exchange or dividend because it makes a difference to your taxable amount well as a shareholder you would prefer that it's considered a sale or an exchange why because when you make a sale you can deduct your basis it's going to reduce your taxable income to figure out your capital gains or capital loss so one thing is you can deduct your basis that's one that's one benefit the second benefit if you have a capital loss you can deduct your capital loss against other capital gains and we discussed this in a prior session and we worked several examples corporate shareholder if you're a corp if you're a corporation you would rather have the distribution treated as a dividend why because you have something called the dividend received deduction you include the income then you can deduct it so this is basically a quick review about stock redemption. Now let's go back and look a quick example to see the big picture here. What, what do we need to discuss? Let's assume I own 60% of my company Farhat Lectures. My wife owns the remaining 40%. I sold all my shares back to my company. So I sold 60% of the shares back to the company. Now my wife still owns 100% of the company now, not still, she still owns the 40% and the 40% becomes the only shareholder and she owns 100%. Now, what happened to my ownership? My ownership went from 60% down to zero. Is this a substantial decrease? Well, that's not only a substantial decrease, that's a complete, complete reduction of my shares. Well, in form it does, in substance it does not. In substance, I'm deemed to still own Farhat lectures. I still own 100% through my wife. So this is what the stock attribution rule. So although I am out, I sold the shares, I'm not really out, I'm, de I'm deemed an owner through my wife. So who are these parties that makes you a deemed owner of the stock, stock attribution rules? This is what we need to discuss in this session. Let's go ahead and get started. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, farhatlectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. For the stock attribution rules, you can be connected to the company through either family members like your wife, or we're going to look at those rules a little bit more in details, all through entity-related entity related relationship, through a corporation or through a partnership. Starting with the family. Well, shares owned by immediate family members such as spouse, children, grandchildren, parents as well, can be attributed to the taxpayer. Although you are out, these individuals, they can bring you back in. So you're not out really. Not siblings or grandparents. Those, that's okay. If they own shares, you are not connected to them. Let's take a look at an example. Adam and Eve, married couple, each own 60 shares of Phoenix Corporation. Together, they own 100% of the company. All the stock was purchased for 100,000. We're going to assume 50,000 paid by Adam, 50,000 paid by Eve. Now, both Adam and Eve serve as directors of the corporation. Now, the corporation redeems, buys back the 60 shares of Adam, but he continued to serve as the on the board, director of the corporation. Okay, now this redemption is treated as dividend distribution, assuming we have enough EMP, because Adam still constructively owns Eve's stock, which is 100% of the Phoenix stock. Now, Adam's basis of 50,000 is transferred to Eve's. Don't go away because remember, Adam's on the whatever the whatever the uh, sale happens to be. Let's assume the company gave Adam three hundred thousand. This three hundred thousand becomes dividend. 
So what happened to his basis that he paid? Well, his basis is transferred to his wife. Now, Eve's basis is 100,000, which is her 50,000 plus the 50,000 of Adam's. So the basis, when she sells her shares, the basis in the stock is 100,000. So basis don't disappear. They got transferred to the person that still deemed you as the owner. You could also be an owner through partnership attribution rules. From partnership to partner, for example, a partner is considered to own stocks owned by the partnership to the extent the partner's proportionate interest in the partnership. What does that mean? Let's assume if a partnership owns 100% in a company, company A, and you own and a partner has and a partner has 25% in the partnership. So the partnership owns 1,000 shares in company A. You are 25% owner in this partnership. You own 250 shares of company A or deemed to own them for this rule. It could, it could also occur from a partner to a partnership the other way around. Stock owned directly or indirectly by a partner is considered as owned by the partnership. For example, if a partner owns 500 shares in a company, the partnership is deemed to own those 500 shares. It could also be transferred from partner to partner. If a partner owns stock directly or indirectly, any other partner who owns more than 50% of the partnership is deemed to own that stock as well. For example, if partner A owns 1,000 1, shares in company A and partner B owns more than 50% of the partnership, partner B is considered to own those 1,000 1, shares by partner A of company A. You could also be connected through corporate attribution rules from corporation to shareholders and vice versa as well. A shareholder is considered to own the stock, owned directly or indirectly by a corporation, again in proportion to their share of the ownership in that corporation. Example, for example, if a corporation owns 1,000 shares of Apple stock and shareholder A owns 10% of the corporation, that shareholder is considered to own deemed 100 shares of Apple stock. And conversely, if the shareholder owns the stock, the corporation is also considered to have owned that stock as well. Now, what are transactions that are treated as redemption? In other words, what are some of the transactions that when the company buys back the shares from the shareholders, it's treated as a redemption, it's treated as a sale, where we have a sale minus the basis, and that's what the shareholder want, to get to the capital gain or capital loss. Well, the following are exceptions. Distribution resulting in termination of shareholder interests. Well, you just told me if I sell all my shares, I might, be, I might not, I may not be out. Well, we're going to look at specific rules. You may sell all your shares, even between husband and wife, and there's an exception where you can get out of it. Then you are no longer deemed a shareholder. We'll look at these rules. Distribution for settling estate taxes. Well, the person dies. Then we need to buy back their shares to pay for estate taxes. We'll look at that. Distribution not fundamentally equivalent to a dividend. And this is going to be evaluated by a subjective test. This proportionate distribution, this is called the 80-50 rule. That's also when it applies. Now, remember, if the transaction not qualifies as a stock redemption, it's qualified as ordinary dividend, assuming the company has EMP earnings and profit. And remember, if it's qualified as ordinary dividend, the basis in the redeemed stock is allocated to the remaining stock owned either directly or indirectly via the constructive ownership. So the basis don't go away. The basis are transferred. For example, they went from Adam to Eve because Eve is the person that kept Adam involved in this corporation. Let's take a look at exception one. Okay. The complete termination is eligible for sale or exchange treatment. Okay. But remember, if you have a family due to the stock contribution, it often does not qualify a disproportionate redemption. However, there's an exception. Family and attribution rules are not applicable if the former shareholder retained no interest except as a lender for a minimum of 10 years. So you have to be out and you have to be out for 10 years. You can't go back and buy any stocks. Now, if you have a creditor relationship, creditor means if you lend the money, that's fine, but you cannot be an owner. Also, you have to send a letter to the IRS saying, I am out for 10 years. Also, you have to be out in terms of management, consultancy, advice. You're no longer involved in the company except as a creditor if that's the case. Then, when I sell my shares, I'm not involved. My wife is still involved. That's fine. I'm out. I can treat the redemption as a sale. Let's take a look at an example. Thomas holds 60% in Blue Corporation. The remaining shares are owned by his wife, Amelia. 
and 10% by Sophia, a vital employee. Blue Corporation purchased all of the interest of Thomas at its fair value. Uh, what happened as a result? What's left is Amelia and Sophia. Amelia and Sophia. Remember, Amelia owns 30%. Sophia own 10%. Now together they own the full 40%. 30 out of 40 is 75%. Now Amelia is 75% owner. And Sophia, 10 out of 40 is 25% owner. So Amelia is still the major at 75%. If the two requirements for the family attribution waivers are met, if they are met, the transaction would qualify as a complete termination and would result in a sale for Thomas. If the waiver are not satisfied, Thomas will, be, will deem to own the shares of his wife and the entire distribution will be taxed as dividend, assuming we have enough EMP. Let's take a look at this, continue with this example. Assuming that Thomas qualify for the family attribution waiver, in the year of redemption, Thomas will treat this transaction as a sale or an exchange. However, if he purchases Sophia's stock or get involved by any interest, in the next seven years after the redemption, what he has to do, he has to tell the IRS, I acquired a prohibited interest. And as a result, we have to go back to that transaction where we redeem the shares and reclassify it as dividend. So Thomas must notify the IRS that that happened and he will owe additional taxes. The second exception, redemption to pay death taxes and other expenditure. What does that mean? It means in case of death, we need to, the company needs to buy back the shares from the shareholder to give them some cash. It could be considered a redemption. This rule allow liquidity for an estate to pay taxes when it involved non-publicly traded companies. Usually this happens with small family business because they need money to pay the estate taxes. Say, well, if that's the case, would allow you to redeem some of the stock, the corporation to give you cash, and it will be considered a redemption. Sale or exchange treatment applies if the stock value surpasses, exceeds 35% of the adjusted value of the estate. What does that mean? What, what happened when someone dies, they look at their, the fair market value of their estate, look at everything from fair market value, stocks, bonds, real estate, boats, airplanes, whatever they own. As long as 35% or more is tied up in stock, then we can liquidate and have it as a redemption. If it's not 35%, then you can. So the first thing is the stock value of the estate has to exceed 35% the stock. This special treatment is restricted to the combined sum of death taxes, funeral expenses, and administrative cost. So when you take out the money, what's considered a redemption? The amount that you use for death taxes, funeral expenses, and administrative cost. Anything else will be considered a dividend. The basis of the stock is stepped up to the fair, val fair market value at the time of that. All an alternate valuation date. We'll talk about that later. But simply put, usually the redemption price will match the adjusted basis because in case of that, the fair market, the basis equal to the fair market value. Why? Because there's a step up basis. So when you step up the basis and you sell the stock immediately, the fair market value and the basis should be the same. There should be no tax implication. Let's take a look at an example. Victoria's adjusted gross estate is worth 30 million. So all her estate is worth 30 million. The tax taxes and the funeral cost expenses for the estate amounted to 2,880. The gross estate of the Violet Corporation valued at 11,200,000. So we have stocks in there and we have 11.2 million worth of stocks in this company, in V company. Well, let's take a look at the percentage. If we take 11.2 million divided by 30 million. So if we take 11.2 divided by 30 million, that's going to give us 37.33%. We have enough stocks in the company to qualify for the redemption because it's more than 35%. Victoria bought the stock eight years ago for 1.2 million. We really don't care because what we're going to be using, we're going to have a step up basis. And the corporation redeemed 2,880,000, the needed amount for death taxes and for the funeral. Okay. As the value of the stock is exceeds 35%, we qualify for the 303 exception. And what we do is we liquidate the stock 2.8 million. We say the basis are 2.8 million, therefore there's no tax consequences. Third exception, not essentially equivalent dividend. This is where you have to argue that this exchange is essentially not dividend. Okay? It's just basically, it's a subjective determination. This rule was specifically meant for the redemption of preferred stock, but could apply to 
common stock as well. So basically, the preferred stock would say, look, I am buying, you are buying back my shares, but I'm not really an owner. So it's really, it's, it's a purchase. Common stockholder, they started to argue, look, you're buying back my shares, but I'm losing a lot of control of the company. I'm not, I'm no longer in control. It should be considered a substantial reduction. Okay. So the reduction must, the redemption must lead to a substantial reduction, meaningful reduction in the shareholder interests. Okay. Now, what could be some indicators? What could you argue? You would argue that I'm no longer have a voting control. I'm no longer in charge. Or you can say, um, I am reducing my participation in corporate profit or liquidation, um, receive assets upon liquidation. So let's take a look at this example. Again, this is a subjective measurement. Alex owned 75% of the common stock of Phoenix. After the redemption, his ownership went from 75 to 65. Okay. Alex still maintained voting control over Phoenix. So, for example, Alex cannot argue this is a meaningful reduction. Okay. Consequently, the, the all the redemption, the 10% redemption, will be considered dividend assuming the company has sufficient earnings and profit. How about if Alex goes from 75 to 40 percent alex might try to argue look i'm no longer in control i want this transaction to be treated as a sale just it's a subjective measurement the fourth exception is called the 80 50 rule it's qualifying disproportionate redemption 80 50 a redemption is seen as a disproportionate redemption if we have to we have to have two conditions to be met the shareholder retain less than 80 percent of their previous interests post redemption. So after the redemption, he owns 80% less of his previous redemption, not 80% of the company, 80% less of his previous redemption. And notice here, and his shareholder, total shareholder interest is less than 50%. So after the sale, he owns less than 50% of the company and less than 80% of his previous position. The best way to illustrate this with a number. With numbers if shareholder owns 60 out of 100 so right now the shareholder owns 60 percent of the company this shareholder decided to redeem sell back 25 shares what's left is for him is 35. now he owns 35 out of 75. simply put his his new structure of ownership is 35 out of 75 which is he owns now current ownership is 46.66 which is less than 50 percent so the first the first condition is met he owns less than 50 percent does he less owns less than 80 percent of his previous position well he owns 60 percent times 80 percent 48 percent he has to own less than 48 percent and 46.66 is less than 48 percent he met both conditions this transaction will be qualify as what as a redemption. Why? He owns overall less than 50% and he owns less than 80% of, of his previous ownership. What's the effect on the corporation with the redemption? If there's a gain or loss, if property other than cash is used for redemption, corporation recognize the gain, not the loss. We already should know this rule. What should the company do under those circumstances? Sell the asset, sell the property, recognize the loss, use the proceeds to buy back the shares from the shareholders. What is the effect on EMP? Corporate effect on EMP. And a qualifying stock redemption means it's a sale. Well, if it's a sale, EMP is reduced by the sum not exceeding the proportional share of EMP attributed to the redeemed stock. Now you can reduce EMP, but it has to be in proportion to the ownership of the person. So if you reduce their ownership by 25%, EMP is reduced by only 25%. Bear in mind, any corporate Expenses related to the stock redemption, such as accounting, brokerage, legal, loan fees, are non-deductible. Non-deductible expenses. Why? Because those are not expenditure needed to operate the business. This is not operating the business. This is a finance. This is you're changing the ownership structure. This is a finance transaction, therefore not operating expenses, therefore not deductible. You're going to reduce the equity. It's not deductible on the income statement, not deductible for tax purposes. Ocean Corporation, which currently has 200 shares of stock, in a qualifying stock redemption, Ocean Corporation pays 300,000 to buy back 60 shares. 60 out of 200 is, this is a 30% redemption. At the time of the redemption, Ocean paid in capital 
has paid in capital of 200,000 and earnings and profit of 600,000. Well, EMP is reduced only by 180. Why 180? It's 30% reduction in the ownership, 30% reduction in EMP. This is what we this is what this is what I just said earlier. The remaining amount of the redemption reduces what? The remaining reduces paid in capital, we reduce paid in capital. We don't expenses, not an expense, not an expense. We just reduced paid in capital equity. However, if 60 shares were redeemed for 100,000 instead, the EMP would be reduced by 100,000, which is the exact amount paid by the corporation. Not, we don't, we don't reduce it by 180. If we paid 100, our reduction is 100,000. So it's the lower, you cannot go more than 30%, but if you paid less, well, if the owner accepted less, that's fine, um, you will reduce EMP by less. What should you do now? You should go to Farhat Lectures, look at additional MCQs, true-false, additional lectures, simulations that's gonna help you understand stock redemption, stock attribution rules, whether you are a CPA exam candidate, whether you are an enrolled agent or an accounting student, invest in yourself, you need to know these topics, Good luck, study hard, and of course, stay safe.